UCLA Longevity Center website, and I'm Linda Erkeley, and I'm the interim director of the Longevity Center. And today we're going to talk about some very interesting and cool things you can do, um, and someone can do who has dementia or Alzheimer's disease to really enrich their lives and and then do some cognitively stimulating uh, exercises as well. So our guest today is Mary Miklovitz from the Opeka Adult Daycare Center. And she is the executive director of Opeka. And in this time, she has implemented many programs, including brain trains, art and music therapy, and uh, intergenerational programs as well. So Mary is an expert in enriching the lives of people with memory problems. And she is going to be our guest today. She was the director of the Culver City Senior Center and has over 30 years in the hospitality and senior services industry. She has an MBA from the University of Phoenix and an undergraduate degree in economics and communications from Marymount College in New York. So Mary, it's really good to have you here today. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to hopefully sharing some very important tips with people and, and answering questions they might have um, for suggestions. Um, should we get started? Absolutely. Okay. Let me just get to this. And so here's the agenda we're going to go over. We're going to talk about the importance of engagement and socialization. In particular, we're going to talk about the benefits of exercise, art, and music, which are our core fundamentals out of PICA for engagement and cognition. Um, we're going to talk about in-person versus virtual programming, the benefits of each. And I'm also going to just, I have some information to provide to you that um, talks about the differences between adult day healthcare and adult day program and the value of what an adult day program can be compared to private caregivers or placement in a care community, which is, I used to operate care communities, so I'm very familiar with those as well. Um, and then we have a flyer about our virtual program called Opika on Zoom, or otherwise known as Oz. And we have um, a list of some online programs that we're offering, and we also have support groups. And we'll talk about how important those can be as well for both the, in, the diagnosed individual as well as the family caregiver. So um, the benefits of exercise. So when our overall goal is to improve the care and quality of life of the participants who come to us, and we find that when people are engaged and supported, they usually sleep better, they're less anxious, they're less depressed. And socially isolated individuals are more likely to experience depression, poor health, greater memory issues, and dementia. Um, social engagement can also help maintain critical thinking skills and, and slow the decline. And, um, Studies in Finland have shown that social interaction involves and engages the whole brain, which is very important in terms of um, slowing down the decline. And individuals derive a sense of purpose when they are engaging with others, connecting with others, and that leads to better physical as well as mental health. Um, they connect and they have the, they connect on a journey together. So they, they have a sense of community, which is very important. And um, so when we talk about engaging people in social settings, uh, the socialization through the benefits of exercise, it supports the, um, uh, it helps lessen the depression on the exercise. And I think I skipped a slide and I'll look at that in a minute because I'm seeing the benefits of exercise. Just let me go back. I'm sorry, I did skip a slide. I apologize. So when we talk about supporting brain health, um, we're engaging with others, similar to how physical exercise helps the body tone, the, um, the cognitive programs that we do and the music and the art, they support the brain health and it improves the focus of the individual. 
It helps them strengthen their sense of time and place. And it generates a stronger sense of inclusion that they, they're not isolated. And um, it again helps with uh, decreasing the depression and the anxiety and stress and possible mood swings. So it, socialization needs to be in a supportive, nurturing environment. And the, I personally think the best place for that, if not at home, is in an adult daycare setting. Um, and they should have a consistent schedule and have familiar faces that they recognize when they go. Then on the benefits of exercise is our next main focus. Exercise can potentially slow and, and reverse some of the, the symptoms of dementia, because a lot of times as the, as the dementia progresses, the physical abilities decline significantly. So physical exercise is a vital tool in the care plan of the individual. It helps um, it, when, when we say depression, a study found that 30% of people living with Alzheimer's disease will experience major depression, which can further intensify the, the memory loss. Physical exercise stimulates the production of hormones and neurotransmitters associated with memory and mood, helps to alleviate the mood and enhance the memory and learning. Exercise is fun can be fun. Well, a little bit later, I'll talk about how to do exercise to make it fun. Um, social interactions are important and exercise, and they we ask them to help each other encourage in exercising. So the photo you see here is actually Tai Chi. And all of our exercise is chair-based. If a person um, decides to stand, we will have a staff member near them should their balance start to wobble. Um, but we encourage them to be seated for the most part. Um, another uh, important part about exercise is it helps with restlessness and wandering. Um, it can, a person who expends energy on exercise is gonna be less likely to be agitated and wandering and, um, than someone who's sedentary. So the, the exercise helps the human body feel more relaxed and they, with that, then they tend to be more steady in the program. They're not getting up and walking around as much and as agitated. Um, the change of environment and exercise, if you're going for a walk, can provide a visual and auditory experience as well, as opposed to being in a confined space. Uh, at Opeka, in addition to doing the chair exercises, we are fortunate enough to be located in a park so we have some hardscape area that we use to walk around a large swimming pool. And we do that almost every day, other than rainy days. Um, if it's really cold outside, we won't go out. We'll do more chair exercises instead. But um, the walks are really nice and everyone is escorted, has an individual escort when they go out so that they're supported um, if they need that support. And if someone is even attending who might be in a wheelchair, then we will take them out in the wheelchair as needed. Um, the next piece that exercise is beneficial for is balance and coordination. Um, obviously fall risk are really um, high, our adults, older adults with dementia have a high risk of falling. And any type of trauma with that, with hospitalization or potential surgery can be very difficult and cause a further decline, a rapid decline. So we do everything we can to um, strengthen their leg muscles so that they can be better in better shape and reduce the risk of falling. We also look at a lot of the surfaces that we have in our community to make sure that everything is, is to minimize fall risk. We have um, hard floors, if you will, but they're, they have padding on them so that it's not concrete, it's a little softer and um, just transition thing. And we look for a lot of different ways to make sure that have any, we minimize fall risk. We also work with um, occupational therapists who come in and will give us advice in terms of how we can further improve our um, services as well as what the, how the staff help people with movement to minimize fall risk. Cardiovascular complications, um, that's something that's usually often associated with dementia um, and any condition that impairs blood flow to the brain 
also increases a risk of vascular dementia. It could be a, one of the comorbid conditions that's a high risk with dementia. So routine exercise along with diet uh, is central to the prevention and treatment of the cardiovascular complications. Sleep problems, those are often very common as well. So lack of sleep can impair cognition and memory, um, whether or not you have dementia. And sleep deprivation is associated with fatigue, irritability, depression, lack of motivation, forgetfulness, um, can throw balance off. So routine exercise can help make sure someone has a restful evening because exercise will help them relax at the end of the day and hopefully get a better night's sleep than what they might've been previously having. And cognitive impairment, routine exercise also helps to prevent um, further loss of cognitive impairment. It helps maintain a better health condition. Um, inevitably things do deteriorate, but it whatever you can do to maintain that health really helps minimize or slow down, I should say, the, the rate of de decline. Um, then um, some of the challenges in terms of uh, how to overcome those challenges of exercise, because you'll get people saying, I don't feel like it, I don't wanna do it. Um, chair exercises again, encouraging people, even if they wanna watch TV, you know, lift your legs, stretch your legs, um, try and, and raise your arms up over your head. Yoga, Tai Chi, those are great. They're wonderful for chair. There's a lot of those virtually available. Walk around the neighborhood in the park. It doesn't have to be a long walk. Start with short and build up as you go along. Um, do some chores around the house that involve stretching. Gardening can be a chore that can be enjoyable, but yet you can get out and maybe stretch a little bit in the yard. Um, getting them outside is important. Um, you can go to a class at, if not a daycare center, perhaps you can go to um, a community, a, a senior center. Um, uh, sometimes they, if you go there with someone who has dementia, they wanna be sure they have a caregiver. So looking at community-based programs that offer exercises for older adults is another option. And just, you know, schedule thoughtfully, mindfully, meaning that, you know, you know when your loved one is most um, active and attentive. Is it a morning, are they a morning person or are they an early afternoon person? So if you're going to exercise, do it when it's their best time and they're going to be more motivated and more um, willing and compliant to go with you. Schedule smart. With um, again, is looking at their body clock. Um, music is helpful. It can be very motivating in the exercise. So incorporating music into the exercise, you can turn music on in the house. And even if they just dance a little, if they're dancing in place and making sure they have a partner, um, that can also be just moving a little bit is great. And slowly build again, just making sure you do a little at a time and then increase that over time so you get more, uh, a longer duration. And, and the pace is comfortable, making sure you have a nice pace. And you can also add props for lack of a better word. Um, at Opico, we use pom-poms in the morning when we first start. We have people arrive and they have some coffee. And when we formally start our program, we're, we've got the pom-poms and people are, using them to shake them. So they're stretching with that. Um, people can use stretch bands as well. The athletic stretch, stretch bands, use a beach ball because it's not heavy. And if it hits them, it's not gonna hurt. So you can do a beach ball in an area. And again, they're using hand-eye coordination and they're stretching with their arms. So that's another good one to use as well. Um, and if you're outside, please make sure you have shade to protect them from the sun. So our next is the benefit of art. Um, we have um, a really robust art program at Opica. We offer art all five days of the week that we, we offer programs. And we have a combination of just art class and then we have therapeutic art. Uh, what you see here is a photo of several people working on a community painting. And we do that once a year because once a year we offer an art show where we put on, uh, we present all the artwork done by all of our participants. 
and um, it's sold to raise money to pay for the art program. But um, we always have a collaborative painting that's done by all of them. So this particular uh, photograph is the collaborative painting. Um, creative activities like art give an opportunity for nonverbal expression. I, I We had a woman come in one time who couldn't remember her grandchildren's name and it just devastated her daughter. And we, uh, during her visit, um, we took her into the art room and she sat down with one of our therapy interns and um, they were chatting as she painted. And when she was done with the painting, she had painted all the names of the grandchildren on the painting. She couldn't say them, but she could paint them. So it has a, it's a different method of communication that a lot of people find an outlet for. Um, it increases brain stimulation. It can stir the memories such as the names of the grandchildren. It can encourage speech for some people. Um, it gives them a sense of accomplishment and a sense of purpose. A lot of them come and say, I've never painted before, but it's amazing when you give them a paintbrush or a pencil, whatever medium they choose to use, um, that as they build confidence and they just, it, there is no right or wrong, they just start painting, it, it all comes up for the best. Um, it helps to boost the cognitive function of the brain as well. It improves the memory because it jogs memories when they're thinking about what they're going to paint. They may paint their pet dog or something like that or, or their old house that they grew up in. Uh, and it brings joy and happiness. It's a sense of achievement. And it also, when we say boost physical strength, they are using their arms more and their hands. It helps with their hand strength, which is important as well. Um, overall enhancing mood and general well-being. And then we go to music. We have, again, a lot of music at Opeka. And um, we do a lot of, well, we did a lot of dancing. And we will do a lot of dancing again and, and sometime soon. We will probably dance in our seats when we resume our programs. Um, but people can still tap and, and move their bodies in their chairs and enjoy the music nonetheless. Um, so music. Um, some ways you can use music at home is as you start your day, you can put on some music and have some, some uplifting songs, helps people if they're having difficulty maybe picking out clothes or getting dressed or doing the, the morning hygiene. If you um, sort of redirect them with the music and they forget that they're, they don't like getting dressed or brushing their teeth or whatever it might be. The music might be able to change it if they have a, like a favorite song, You Are My Sunshine, or something that just makes them really happy and uplifted and, and make sort of a dance and a song out of doing the chore of putting on the, the, the morning routine. Um, it also can help break repetitive behavior. If you put on a song and someone has been asking a repetitive question or having a repetitive um, motion, then the music can help again redirect them so that they're not doing that anymore. It can help with communication. Sometimes a lot of them have lost the ability or they may lose the ability to speak, find their words, but when they hear the music, they will, their body will move along. And we have a, a, a woman in our program who has minimal, minimal vocabulary but when we play a particular song, she will take the microphone and sing the entire song because that is a memory for her. So music is incredibly powerful in that respect. Um, and it also can help people in the nighttime in terms of lulling them to sleep. I know when my father was very sick, I used to, he loved classical music. So I would turn on low in his room classical music so he could just drift off to sleep with that and that helped him to relax. So um, those are some things you can do. Um, and then we are presently offering virtual programs right now. And what I put together here is a list of engagement programs that are available through these different links here. The Alzheimer's uh, of Los Angeles, they have activities you can do at home. They offer support groups. They have education programs. So if you go to that link, there's a lot of choices you can browse and look around. Uh, another organization, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, uh, they're based out of New York, but they have um, 
quite a bit of resources available. I listed some of them in terms of a toll-free helpline, telephone-based support groups, and they also have in their teal room, they have a number of different activities, again, that you can do from home during this pandemic. So that works, that's a great um, link. There's also the Health Professions Press is another source. Uh, Daily Caring has a lot of programs available. Golden Cares is another one. And then um, CADS is an organization for those of us who provide programs, adult day health cares and adult day programs. So CAD stands for the, the California Association of Adult Day Services. And it works with Easter Seals and puts out this weekly schedule. Easter Seals sends it to CADS and they send it out. Um, if you go to that link and I put down there to sign up on your own to have it sent to you on a regular basis, you need to send an email to that PCCP address. And then you can you request to be on their email list for those programs and they'll send it to you directly. But CADS does post that um, every week. So they put together, they don't normally have, um, it's sent out by them. So I asked them to create something that I could share with you today. So that was the link they provided me. And then OPICA, I gave you the link to our programs. Um, we are doing virtual right now. I'll explain that a little more in depth in a moment. Uh, we hope to go back in person in the uh, late summer, early fall. Um, we're just completing those improvements. We're also improving our outdoor patio space, which is involving a little more significant work in terms of tearing up um, the ground and, re and setting in some footings of a brand new structure that's going to provide more shade. Um, so we have Monday through Friday. When we're in person, we're normally from nine until four. Our online programs are from 10 to two right now. And um, there's a schedule for it. So if you uh, are interested, we can send you that schedule. Uh, what I gave you next is, this is um, an overview from the CADS organization of adult day services. And it's basically explaining that, you know, this is an alternative again, to having either private caregiver, in some cases you may do both, or putting them in a care community, such as an assisted living community, a life care community, and or skilled nursing community. Um, and people usually come anywhere from two days a week to five days a week. Um, we do have a contract with the Veterans Administration. So if someone's a veteran, then the VA pays for that if they qualify. And we help you walk you through that in terms of how to find out if you qualify. Um, and the, the hours per day can range anywhere from four to up to eight. And that depends. Um, while they're there, they are given a meal. Uh, they're given a snack actually in the morning. They're given a lunch and then they're given a snack in the afternoon. Um, so adult day health care is um, actually it's licensed by the public health department. And in adult day healthcare, that's a medical model. So that is reimbursable through Medi-Cal, Medi Medi -Cal, Medicare, sorry, I always get Medicaid and Medi-Cal <laughs> mixed up. Um, so it's, and some of them are private pay, but they, they do have that, that re, um, reimbursement mechanism through Medi-Cal. And uh, they will provide the, the um, outpatient, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy services. And what is supposed to happen is this is in lieu of going into a skilled nursing facility. So if you have that kind of medical need, you would attend one of these types of programs. Uh, when indeed a lot of people go there for the social and don't have a medical need, but it was originally intended to be um, strictly for the medical option. Um, I used to be on a, a county commission that oversaw the applications for these. So um, I know what was intended and what actually wound up happening. <laughs> so, um, but those, there's an abundance of these throughout the state and uh, especially here in Los Angeles. And if you needed, um, you, there's a link up there to find a center through the CADS link. They can help you find that um, if you had questions on that. And then you have the community-based adult services um, 
Again, that's a medical model. And then under that, you have the, the community based, the CBAS, as it's known as its acronym, is still the Adult Day Healthcare. It's just a different name for it. It's a little different. Things have changed into that direction. And Adult Day Programs, ADP, um, those are non medical. And they are licensed by the California Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing. So um, we don't provide medical services. If someone came in with a catheter or an oxygen tank, we have to apply for a waiver, um, which we've already done for both of those things. So we are approved if someone had that need on a temporary basis, especially the catheter, um, we would be able to accommodate them. Um, we, anything more severe than that is not allowable for us to provide for like a stoma or some other feeding tube type things. We would not be able to accommodate that. Um, so we do offer medication dispensation at Opica. Uh, we can help with that. And we do have uh, a program with, with nursing students who come in and help with, um, assessing, people checking their heart, um, blood pressure and um, other vital signs just to get a baseline. And it, from time to time, we do a weight check and vital check. Um, then when we talk about the value of programs and services of an adult day program versus other options, and this is just a little bit of an introduction explaining how um, it allows you to be at home with your family members and it is it is a lower cost alternative. And here is an actual grid showing you where to come to a peak of five days a week um, for the, between the hours of nine and four, which averages to $13 an hour of cost. That's what the monthly cost would be. Now, we also have financial assistance because we understand not everyone can afford um, the daily rate, if you will, is $89 a day. And that's pretty consistent with other adult day programs in the area of Los Angeles as well. So if that's difficult, then we do have financial assistance um, and we provide that information upon request. Uh, it shows you here the private caregivers. Um, private caregivers now are, um, you know, they're running anywhere from 20 to $30 an hour, it really depends on who you use, whether or not they're licensed. There's a lot of, um, uh, pieces involved, considerations involved. Uh, some people do try to hire privately and not go through an agency. And my suggestion on that is um, do your diligence. The, the benefit of having an agency is from a workman's compensation side. If there is an injury to the individual, you're protected. And uh, if you go through an agency, if you hire privately, you're exposed. Um, I looked at that when my own father needed assistance. And um, so we went through an agency. It is more money, but it's also protecting um, your family from financial retribution if it were to happen. Um, they also um, will bond and fingerprint from the organization, the companies as opposed to privately. So um, just some things to consider if you're looking to do a caregiver. Some people may do a caregiver for AM care and PM care, and they come to Opeka during the day. We also have people who come with their private caregivers because they may be a much higher level of need. It's a two or three person assist in the bathroom because perhaps the wheelchair bound. So the family prefers that the caregiver stays with them while they're at Opeka. So that's also doable as well. Um, and then you see assisted living and skilled nursing. Um, unfortunately, here in Southern California, the cost of real estate just drives up the uh, cost of the care communities significantly. Um, so that information is there for you. And this is OPICA's virtual program, OZ, OPICA on Zoom. So again, it's 10 to 2, Monday through Friday. Um, different activities and exercise, cultural experiences. We do have a calendar available that we can provide to you. Um, we will at some point in the future have the ability, we just acquired a software that if you wanted to know what your loved one did at Opica during the day, you can log on to the software and find out what classes they attended. 
We're not there yet, but we will be there in a couple more months. Um, but so you can see we have a welcome for the first half hour. And we will do exercise. And it's a combination of yoga and Tai Chi and chair exercises. Um, then we have a culture or cognitive hour that changes every day. So that it's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you get a mixture of things and it's not stagnant. And then the lunchtime companionship is while they have lunch, uh, we have marriage and family therapy interns who will join them for lunch and engage them in conversation. So they, it's kind of a fun chatty time. And then the one to two hour is when we're going to have music. Uh, we will have some art programs and um, uh, some and the art. The music will vary from entertainer to entertainer. Occasionally, it might be a recorded production of maybe um, um, Boston Pops or something of that nature. Um, we also get to have the UCLA Music School come in too, so that's fun. So some of the programs we have online right now, we have the Mini Brain Train. That is our early memory loss program. We have a mindfulness-based art program, and that can also be available to the, to the caregivers as well as the individuals. Um, we have art class that's done online, Nisei group, Spirit Builders is, is a support group. They do a lot of storytelling and it's really a self-esteem building program um, when we talk about Spirit Builders. And part of that is an art component as well. And then the Opika on Zoom programs, those are some an example of some of the programs, uh, the Friendship Group, the Funky Friday Music Group, um, storytelling and um, chair exercises again and music. So that's more or less what we do on the Zoom. And we also have support groups and individual counseling available. So just um, there's a link in our website that tells you what days we have, what pro some of them are for spouses, some of them are for adult children and some of them are mixed. Um, we offer five different support groups and they are facilitated by marriage and family therapist. And then lastly, I'd just like to thank you for joining us today. And these are some, some staff members, if you wish to contact them directly for any additional information. And you may want information about something entirely, and we'll do our best to provide that to you. So if you have any questions of any kind, we're more than happy to uh, refer you to, you know, if you live somewhere else and you want to know, I live in Orange County, where's our program, we will do with our best to find one as close to you as we possibly can. So questions or Dr. Urkeley? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mary. That was your wealth of information. Um, I do have a lot of questions and we have a couple from, from the audience um, as well. One of the things that, you know, that sometimes we forget about in, in this business, not you, but maybe others, is <laughs> how important it is that somebody, even if they have a memory problem, even if they have dementia, that they still appreciate activity. They appreciate enrichment. And you're talking about sense of achievement. You're talking about not being bored. Boredom is one of the major problems that we see in, in the patients that I see. So somebody comes in, let's say for a neuropsychological evaluation, which is part of what I do. And we, we give them a workup of their cognitive abilities and they may have, you know, early stage dementia. And um, one of the things that we hear about is how they're, they're bored and may, they may not use the word bored, but they can't do the things they used to do. They don't have that fulfillment in their life. You know, they can't, if they, if they had hobbies, maybe they used to build, you know, be carpenters or they used to sew and some of those skills just go by the wayside as people become uh, more progressed in their illness. And the, the families find a major challenge in, you know, how can, what can we do for him? Or maybe they might, may not quite realize like how, how he just, or she just can't go back and do those kinds of things. And they'll say, well, he doesn't want to, or he's not interested. And we hear a lot of that. But really, boredom is a major problem. And, and also, this affects their cognitive status. It affects their quality of life. 
And ultimately, like you're talking about a sense of achievement and self-esteem. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, to keep somebody who, who has dementia, to keep them happy with feeling, uh, feeling a sense of achievement, value, and having enrichment in their lives. So I think adult daycare is a great way to get this. I think it's a great bang for one's buck, quite frankly, um, because where else can you go for $89 and stay all day and get two snacks and a hot lunch and people <laughs> and care about your loved one? It's, it's, the bar, it's a bargain and we know that the business of dementia care is not a bargain, right, if you're caregiving. Um, but one of the questions that comes up a lot is that caregivers often say, gosh, I really want to take mom or dad to, uh, you know, adult daycare, but they don't want to go. And they say stuff like, oh, I don't belong with those people, or I don't want to leave the house. They're, you know, they want to be around their loved ones and they're very clingy. How should um, a caregiver deal with that? who really does want to introduce their loved one to adult daycare, how, how can they deal with that, that challenge? Well, indeed, that's an obstacle. Um, yes. And the way that we try to work with that is um, learn a little about the person ahead of time. What are their interests? What was their line? If did they work? What kind of work did they do? Um, a little bit about the family so we know what the resources are in the family as well. And then we invite them in to have, well, <laughs> a little bit different right now, but normally um, we invite them in to have lunch. And what we do is we meet them in a room that's um, back in our counseling wing. So they haven't seen the room yet. Um, what we also try to do is find out in advance, where are they in this journey? Are they early? Are they moderate? You know, because that's going to make a difference too. Where, in terms of um, how they see them and how they see themselves fitting in. So that can have an impact on, on their um, willingness to come in. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to have them come in and have lunch and have a conversation over lunch. So they get to know us a little bit better as well. And then we usually invite them out to join the, the afternoon program after lunch is music. Um, and they will, and it, again, with the lunch, we also check to make sure that they don't have any particular dietary concerns that we need to address in providing a lunch to them as well. Right. Um, so then we take them out to um, the main room uh, and it's it's usually a music in the right after lunch and dancing. So it's usually a lot of fun. Um, and the way we present it is just saying, let's go hear some music. And we don't really talk about it being a daycare program. If we know there's going to be resistance, we'll address it more of let's go enjoy some music and just listen to the music. And then we'll show them the art room because that's going on simultaneously or, you know, um, and if we know that they've done art before, they'll be invited to join the art class or they may just look and say, oh, I don't do any art. And that's fine. We'll go back out to the music room. Um, and then after the music, typically people leave, but every once in a while when they know that there's yoga or Tai Chi coming, they're interested. It, it, it's a case by case basis. Um, sometimes the first visit works well, other times it doesn't. We invite them to come back on a trial basis for a couple more visits where they do a longer day. They come before lunch and have lunch in the room with the rest of the participants. Um, Again, depending on the individual, they may or may not have that caregiver join them. Um, but if if the caregiver were to join them for the second visit, then we would try and do a, yet another visit where the caregiver says, "I need to go pick something up at the store. Let me go. I'll be back in a few minutes. Um, enjoy whatever program is going on. I'll be right back." And we try and get some separation there to see how things go. Yeah. Um, and it, we just work with them as closely as we can and. Some are more challenging than others, but that's our job to try and do what we can to make them feel relaxed and make them feel comfortable so that they want to come back. And again, exactly. it's really locking into what what pulls at them, what engages them, what, you know, is it the exercise, is it the music, is it the art, is it um, the cognition teacher who's doing the, the, the brain jog program? Um, it's different for every person. 
Right. Yeah, we, we often get caregivers, I think, have sometimes anxiety about leaving their loved one. And, and sometimes I found that people need the reassurance more than that their actual, the actual person with illness is that yeah. their loved one needs to know that they're going to be okay and well taken care of. And let's say something happens, there's an emergency, right? What, you know, do you call the caregiver? Like what, do you have a protocol for that? We do. It, it really kind of depends on what the emergency is to some extent. Um, and I was going to just add in at the for a little tag on that other um, question that sometimes it takes a couple tries before we succeed in getting someone to come in. So someone may come in and come back a few months later. Um, but in terms of emergencies, if it's any kind of loss of consciousness or God forbid somehow they fall and they and they strike their head, that's a nine one one call first mm -hmm. before anyone else is called. So after nine one one then we reach out to the family and explain that we called 911 and why we called 911. So we have forms that are done that we have on hand when someone enrolls with us that, you know, tells us what your hospital preference is and all that information we need to know. Um, if paramedics do respond, then we have um, an abbreviated health history that we give to them. So if they're transporting, they can take that to the hospital in the event the family doesn't get there ahead of them. So that there's they have some basic information on the individual. Right. Um, if someone's not feeling well and they're starting to have an upset stomach and they're not feeling well, we'll call the family and we'll say, you know, your loved one isn't feeling well. Um, would you like to come pick them up? What would you like to do? We have a room we can put them into you get here. So it, you know, it kind of depends on, on what the situation is. Um, sometimes uh, somebody might do a stumble and maybe fall to their knee, but not fall all the way down. And they're adamant they don't want 911 called. Again, we call the family and we explain what might have happened. And the family will, you know, say either I want you to call 911 or I'm coming to get them. Whichever, you know, we work with the family on that. We do um, maintain if someone has a pulse or a DNR, we keep mm -hmm. those on file as well. Wow. Okay. Um, so right. we have we have an emergency book that we keep. Sure do. Um, and when we need something, we have immediate access to that person's critical information in the event we need to use it. Okay. Um, kind of going back to meeting the needs of, of your participants, um, Mary asked us, how is incontinency addressed? So part of the um, intake process is learning the needs of each individual. Do they need assistance with dining? Maybe their hands have, are too arthritic and they can't cut anymore. Do we need to cut that up? Um, do they need incontinence assistance? We do provide that. We ask that the family provides the, the materials for it. And then our staff is trained to accommodate someone into the restroom and um, meet their needs. Some, and that varies. That can be standby assistance. That can be full-on assistance. Uh, whatever it is, we're able to provide that. Um, I think the only time that, you know, as I mentioned something about if someone becomes a two-person assist, uh, in later stages, if sometimes we've had someone who is um, a wider, heavier person, which is harder to lift, and it can be a two or three person assist, we may talk to the family about having a private caregiver in to help with that as well. It doesn't happen often. It's typically a one-on-one -on -one situation with our staff. So we have both male and female staff um, and the gentlemen take the gentlemen to the restroom and the ladies take the ladies to the restroom. Uh, another question, somebody actually asked this ahead of time during registration is somebody's husband no longer recognizes members of the family or can't communicate verbally. Are there still benefits for for a person who's who's progressed to that degree? Are there still benefits for adult daycare? There are. I mean, you know, the family has to decide that. But um, we see it with um, we have a hospice waiver because. Um, because my mother was my first hospice patient and I learned from that that what um, a gift hospice can be. 
And hospice allows people as they are moving into that later stage um, to maintain as much of the regular um, schedule they had and, and, and dignity and, and um, right. going through that latter part. Um, and it, so things are consistent and comfortable. Um, so you just see people in, not necessarily hospice, but in a later stage as they lose that ability to speak um, a lot of times touch is really important. So just when we walk up to them, putting our hand on their shoulder and um, sometimes it's just holding their hand while we're, they're listening to music, sitting next to them and kind of you know, moving with them. They'll tap their feet or move, you know, the, their body will respond to the music. And some of them can paint still, even though they don't have the verbal skills, they can still paint and communicate through their painting. So we see it but the family has to be comfortable with that as well. Yeah, I mean, that, those are really great points that there are other sensory abilities and there's usually some type of cognitive, we call it sparing or preservation left, but you have to find the right exercise that the person can do. So even at home, if somebody needed to, you know, felt like, okay, I wanna take care of my loved one at home, they certainly can put on music and use touch and, and color, even if people are coloring outside the lines, it doesn't matter. No. So, so somebody at home can still engage in these types of um, activities to enrich life. They may not get the same social socialization uh, that they're gonna get if they come to adult daycare though. Is that, do you see that that still is important in, in patients that are more, um, more sensory, uh, you know, sensory challenge. Do you see that they still respond to the socialization? They do. Um, a lot of times when someone's um, more progressed, yeah. uh, we will, we always assign an intern to one-on-one uh, -on -one individual um, participants. And those are the marriage and family therapy interns. So they'll sit next to them in, in the program room and, um, talk to them while programs are going on or they'll we had a gentleman who could become agitated and disruptive and one day someone just decided out of the blue to get some mandala type art and give him some crayons it was a world of difference i mean he was happy as a clam quiet as a mouse and just colored away Mm -hmm. And for the most part, he was in the lines, but nobody cared if he was in the lines. The fact was, right. he was a lot yeah. happier and a lot quieter um, sitting there with his artwork. And no one, none of us really thought he was, that would make him happy. But somebody thought outside the box and said, hey, let's try it. And it worked. Right. So, you know, it's, yeah, you just, you, you try different things to see what it is that, that um, reaches that person. Um, and whether or not, if they can't tell you what that is, we just keep trying different things and they can be tactile things, they can be sensory. There's a number of different ways you can look at doing things to, to try and uh, bring them some satisfaction and some enjoyment. Yeah, I think again, you know, that's the theme that keeps running through here is enjoyment, fulfillment, that this still matters to people. You know, we, we don't always know what they're thinking, but this is still important to people. Assume it's important to people because it is most of the time. Um, somebody asked, Elena asked, are you, is your resource resource list available? The, the that great list that you put on the end <laughs> with all the couple of different like or yeah i don't know if you can if they can avail the slide deck or if they we'll record um, this we'll record the um this is being recorded and it'll be up probably in two three days or so we put it up on the longevity center website so um andy if you're listening maybe you can um you can chat out our website and uh and people can go there in, in a few days um yeah they can also send me an email all of our emails are our first names, mariettopeka.org. And um, they're, you know, because everything that's nonprofit is always .org, not .com. So just bear that in mind. Um, and I'm happy to send it to them. Okay. Um, somebody asked, Mary again asked, 
through the health checks, the blood pressure checks, et cetera. How often does that happen? Um, you have the, the, the nurse, uh, nursing their trainees, right? Come in and do this. Right, so that's an ongoing program with the nurses and the schools rotate, but um, um, it really kind of depends on the individual. So if we know someone has, maybe is on a diuretic, we need to check their weight more often. Yeah. Um, you know, they're gonna get weighed once a week. Um, okay. And, you know, so if, if we know there's a particular concern in that yeah. context, then we're gonna do it more often. Otherwise, it's going to be more like once a month, and in, in somebody's in really good shape, it might be every other month. Okay. Okay. Great. And yep. of course, anytime when someone has, when someone starts saying they don't feel well, we immediately do a blood pressure check. Um, we have the, you know, non-invasive thermometers, and we um, will do a um, dehydration check. The biggest problem really with them is they get dehydrated and they get these UTIs. And yeah. as you know, that just puts, that changes a lot of things very quickly. Um, right. But what we do is we, we actually carry water around uh, two or th three times during the day. Plus we give them water at lunch as well as milk and ju or juice. So we're always looking to hydrate them. Now they have the right to refuse, but if they're not yeah. taking in water, then we're gonna talk to the family and say, you know, we're really concerned that they're not getting enough hydration. You know, maybe okay. they like um, one of those insure drinks, maybe maybe getting those flavored Gatorade drinks will, will do, you know, they don't like water, maybe they want a little flavor to it. So, you know, try, sometimes we, if the family agrees, we will try some of those things and see if that helps them drink. Now, I saw you have a Nisa program. Um, do you do you work with individuals or have Spanish speaking individuals at Opica who can help with bilingual patients or members? The majority of our staff can is bilingual with Spanish. Okay. Um, uh, we had other languages, but some of those um, employees have retired. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a couple of employees who speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, the, the participants who come are really bilingual, um, but what will happen in the Nisei group, they will speak Japanese, they will write Japanese, yeah. they have fun with doing cultural things exactly. in that group. We have about 15% of our population is Japanese American, so. Um, and as sometimes people lose their bilingualism and they revert more back to their native language. It's really important to have that, that ability to communicate in, in their native language. So that's just fantastic. Um, also, I wanted to, to ask one other question. Do you, what's your intergenerational program like? Um, so we work a lot with uh, local schools because they have the community service commitment. So Brentwood School comes in, Notre Dame Academy comes in, uh, St. Monica's comes in, and some of the, there's a new West School down the street um, from us because we're located in Stoner Park. Um, so that school will come in. We used to have the private school, um, Wildwood, who would come in, but they mm -hmm. moved. Um, so with Wildwood, we actually had a program where they would send their senior class to us, they split it in half, and they would do art programs and do them with our participants. And one, what we did is we had these small canvases that the students painted one for themselves, which had no photo on it. And then for our participants, they, we would take photo of them, put it onto the canvas, and then we asked the student that they were assigned to that person to paint something that represented what that person's life was about on the canvas. And then we wove the canvases together on a large wall um, in it's, they're all hooked together in our program room. Um, we also gave some to our uh, politicians to remind them the importance of supporting programs for older adults. <laughs> um, so we, we also, um, we do a lot with UCLA. Uh, mm -hmm. We do the um, service learning program with them. That's a big program in the, in the winter. And then other various professors will ask to send students to us during the year. Uh, Los Angeles City College has a program. So a lot of the educational programs we work with on that. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then otherwise, um, we have a preschool that is run in the park, which is next to us and, um, in a building next to us. And they come in once a month and they perform. Wow. Um, so they're, that's kind of fun to have them there. Um, it's the elementary school. We don't really have much going on with at this time. Um, if, if someone were to say they were interested in doing something, we would definitely develop a program for that. It's, but it's primarily high, it's high school and college that we work with as well as that preschool program that's there. Okay. Well, I, I certainly think people have many ideas now as to how to keep their loved one feeling fulfilled, uh, whether it be at home or sending somebody to an adult daycare program. We have a number of them in LA. So there's, there's Opica, there's Wise and Healthy Aging. If you live in the Valley, there is one generation. Mm -hmm. And Mary, you said you know of others like in Orange County. So, um, you know, it's, it's fabulous that the work that you do is so important. It makes such a difference in the lives, not just of the person who, you know, has memory problems, but for their caregivers too. So it's a great source of caregiver respite, right? I can't recommend it enough is if you're a caregiver and you need a break, this is a great way to, to get a break is to send your, your loved one or have your loved one attend uh, adult daycare. And again, it can be a couple days a week. It can be five days a week. You can, you can make you, you know, pretty much make your own schedule. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I want to thank, thank you, Mary, for coming today. And, and, uh, it's really great to hear, um, hear about everything that you do at Opica and all your advice for our caregivers. Um, I want to thank all of our participants for tuning in today. And remember, um, we chatted in how you can Find out more about what we do at the Longevity Center, including adult educational programs. And we have memory training programs for um, people with just age-related cognitive complaints. Just go to our website, which is in the chat. And um, everybody, thank you and um, take care. And we'll see you next month. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.